technical difficulties. They are all fine now. Hopefully they should be. I can just check. I am at least live on Coaches. So far so good. Um, and then I'm also live on YouTube. So hello and welcome. Sorry about the delay. My name is Ellen Federici Nilsson. I'm a WFM, a woman feeder master from Denmark. I also did one of these lessons yesterday. Yesterday, the lesson was on the Queen's Gambit accepted. You can go and check that one out if you want to. I can see that uh, this one didn't quite want to do the same as me. Uh, no, it did not. Um, <laughs> there we go okay everything should be fine now of course as always if you have any questions anything you're in doubt of then my cam very nice anything you're in doubt of anything you want to know anything which confuses you if you have any questions at all please do let me know i am watching both the youtube live chat on chess 24 and the coaches uh, twitch channel chat don't hesitate to ask i'm sitting here ready to answer all your questions the topic of today is learn from kasparov and i have picked out a game that i very very much like um, from 1980 so 40 years ago um, with mr kasparov versus a guy named zom both grandmasters, both very great players, and I hope that you will find as much joy in this game as I do. So yesterday we looked at the Queen's Gambit accepted, and today we of course also start with 1d4. Kasparov, he is white, we can see that down here, over there. We can see that over there because Kasparov is the first name uh, mentioned. I wrote both Kasparov and his opponent's name, but because Kasparov's name is first, that means he is white and he played 1d4. Today his opponent played, or in 1980, but the game we are looking at today, his opponent played knight f6 and after c4 he played e6. So no queen's gambit accepted today, but we are having another very interesting opening after knight c3 and bishop b4. This opening is called the Nimso Indian. And the Nimso Indian is an opening loved by many, many players. It's a very popular opening. And it's also known to be very sound and very theoretical. This was 40 years ago, so of course, there wasn't as much theory as we do have now. Um, they did have some, and Kasparov, uh, and in the Kasparov versus Karpov World Championship matches, they did play a lot of the Nimso Indian games. Um, they included several uh, continuations from this position. Kasparov, he played knight f3. He also played queen c2. Um, and he also played this move e3 that he played in the game versus Som. And e3 is actually in in my opinion a, a very nice move because what white aims to do here is to avoid the double pawns that you often get on c3 after the bishop captures these days the bishop uh, doesn't really capture before white has played a3 black wants to provoke this move before doing anything radical so of course Black doesn't just give up the bishop uh, here on c3, black waits a little bit. And in this case, black makes uh, a move, c5, attacking the center immediately, which is of course also um, something we want to do. Yes, I do take all of your questions and Gary was his first name. Gary Kasparov um, versus, I actually, his name is, Psalm and his first name starts with I. I forgot what uh, I forgot his his opponent's first name. Um, not very professional of me. I know that he had a rating of twenty five oh five at this time, and Kasparov he had a rating of uh, twenty five ninety five when this game was played. So Kasparov was almost a hundred points uh, higher rated. Which does mean that he was the favorite in this game, but that doesn't mean that he wins the game automatically. 
He is indeed playing a he is indeed playing a strong player. In this position, Kasparov he went for knight e2, protecting this knight on c3, but blocking the bishop on f1. What he wants to do with with knight f3, uh, sorry knight uh, e2, is that. As I said before, he wants to avoid these double pawns on c3. Here his opponent took on d4. And it may look as if white has quite a few options to take back the pawn here. But it's actually not like that. Both knight takes d4 and queen takes d4 are actually quite a bit worse than e takes d4. Uh, which was also played in the game. And it's because if white takes with either the knight or the queen, then white is giving up some very, very important uh, central control. And for example, a move here like knight c6 would immediately show why you shouldn't really take with the queen on d4. So the right move in this position is to take with the pawn to keep your pawns in this to keep the pawns in the center and keep some control in here. In this position, his opponent played castles, getting the king to safety, which is, of course, something uh, something we want to do in the opening. We have those three main principles in the opening that we, that we want to achieve, which I also mentioned yesterday, but let's just take them once more. The first one you want to do is that you want to gain central control. The second one you want to do is that you want to develop your minor pieces, or your pieces in general. The minor pieces are the knights and the bishops. And we want to get them out first because then we can three, get our king to safety. And all those three things are very, very important. And it may seem as if this knight on e2 is a bit awkwardly placed because it is blocking this bishop, um, which then cannot come out this way. But it's very, this is a very, very sound move. Um, avoiding these double pawns and white also has another way of getting the bishop out so firstly white plays a3 and in this position if black takes the knight and white takes back black has not gained anything anything from giving up uh, giving up the bishop pair in this position usually in the nimso indian if you give up the bishop pair you want something in return either very fast development um, white having a double pawn on the c-file or some kind of attack. In this position after knight takes, black does not get any of these things and we can see that black is still undeveloped on the queen side. So taking the knight here wouldn't be a good move because of knight takes c3. Instead white drops back with the bishop. And in this position White played d5 and d5 is a very or was a very uh, popular move in the earlier days and it has also been played quite a bit um, this last uh, these last years. And then we have a question. Why is the king safer on the side surrounded by weak pawns instead of the middle surrounded by its strong pieces? Um, well, I can tell you that the reason that the king is safer uh, around the pawns is because the pawns, they provide a kind of shield for the king. And if white wants to break through the shield, then maybe white has to sacrifice some material because otherwise white has to push these pawns all the way up the board to create any weaknesses in black's camp. These pawns, they are not weak. After d5, this is this is quite a curious move, yeah? The threat is to go d6 and trap this bishop here on e7. Um, so white is pushing the pawn, white is gaining more space in the center, but white is also spending time that he could have spent developing his pieces. In this position, you take with the pawn as black and white takes back with the pawn. You don't really want to take with the knight here because you're spending way too much time uh, moving pieces that you have already moved in the opening and not getting your king to safety. Um, 
and also you're opening up for this diagonal to your king so in this position you you have to be careful and you don't want to leave this c4 pawn weakened um when what when black gets to play a move like e6 bishop e6 and knight c6 black has very easy development and it's not easy to attack the pawn on d6 and use it as a weakness therefore White takes back with the pawn on d5, still keeping the control in the center by having the pawn in the center. Here, once again, white is threatening to, to trap the bishop with d6. Therefore, black has to go rook e8, making space for the bishop on f8. And at the same time, looking at the king on e1. In this position, we also have to mention that d6 would not be uh, would not be very good because that leaves the bishop on e7 very passive and it's not well this bishop goes to f5 but it can very quickly be attacked by a, a knight in the center so it's actually not easy to see where this bishop is going and it's not easy to see where this knight is going because they probably both want to go to d7 but that's not really possible so you want to wait with d6 as black. Instead you play rook e8, making space for the bishop on f8. And then a nice little comment I think is that in the book Dynamic Decision Making by Boris Gelfand, he's actually showing this game because it's the same. Um, this game is between Kasparov and Som has the same opening as a game Boris Gelfand he played himself and in the book he says that he thinks that d6 in this position is the critical move. After d6 black has to play bishop f8 to not lose the bishop and after g3 to get the bishop to g2 and rook e6 we're in the main line. Um, black will win the pawn on e6 but it will take quite a few moves and black's pieces will be a little bit awkwardly placed after taking the pawn and while black spends all this time taking the pawn on d6 white could develop uh, an initiative and the light squared bishop on g2 will become very strong um, in this position white plays bishop f4 protecting the pawn and black still has to spend time picking it up of course this game is 40 years ago so there wasn't this much much theory and Kasparov he played a very natural move he played g3 he wants to get his bishop to g2 and castle kingside to get the king to safety um <laughs> and no i'm not uploading any book today <laughs> after g3 his opponent played bishop c5 and that is for the reason I mentioned before. He does not want to go d6 yet. Because if he goes d6, then this bishop on e7 becomes very passive. Um, but he has to go d6 at some point to develop these pieces on the queen side. So he plays bishop c5 first with the plan of going d6 after. And then saying that the bishop on c5 is better placed on the a7 g1 diagonal than it is on this passive square e7. White plays here, bishop g2, activating this light squared bishop, looking in the center. Um, and now black plays d6. So now we have quite the interesting, if we compare it to the main line uh, from Boris Kelvin's book that I, that I just mentioned, where white was the one playing d6. And if we look at the position now, we can see the differences. This bishop on g2 isn't as strong as if the white pawn had been on d6, but this pawn on d5 is not as weak as the pawn would have been on d6. And these are the kind of nuances that are very important uh, in the game of chess and one of the reasons that I really like the game, because whether the pawn is on d5 or d6 actually makes a really big difference for the entire development of the game. And this will actually be a completely different game than if Kasparov he had played, um, if he had played the critical d6 move as Boris Gelfand says that it is. 
In this position, Kasparov, you played what I think is a very nice nice move, h3. And the point, is, the point of a3 is to take this g4 square away from both the bishop or the knight. Most importantly, the bishop, but the knight also has some trickeries to do in here, pointing at the f2 pawn. Um, so h3 is a very nice move. We can try to say that if, uh, if white castled in this position, then black starts with playing f a5. Seems a bit weird, but the point is just that you want to prevent this b4 move that white could have played otherwise. Of course, now white cannot do it as the rook on a1 is hanging. So white will play another move. A natural move could be bishop f4 in this position. But after bishop g4 now, since white hadn't played h... That was supposed to be an arrow. Since white hasn't played h3 in this position, this bishop is very well placed on g4. This is the exact square it wants to be. And now it's actually Kasparov. I wanted to say white there. Now it's actually white who has to fight for equality in this position. Black is a little bit better here and white has to prove that it is nothing special. Um, for example, we could say that maybe if uh, white played h3, black will just drop back with the bishop to h5, keeping this pin on the knight um, and keeping the pressure down the e-file. This knight will come to d7, heading for e5 and, and white has to find some good moves here to keep equality. And I think for those reasons, Kasparov, he started with h3. Um, sorry. After d6, uh, instead of castling Kasparov, he started with h3 to avoid this very annoying bishop g4 move. Now the bishop came to f5. Um, is it a waste of time to harass the bishop? Uh, in which position? And I do like that little, I do like that little word play there. Um, and which bishop do you mean? I guess you mean the bishop on c5. And I wouldn't say that it's uh, earlier knight a4. Okay, so we don't earlier, I'm not quite sure when, but just in general, we don't want to go knight a4. Uh, because firstly, the knight is misplaced on, on a4. Let's say we want knight a4 in this position. The knight is misplaced on a4. And yes, it is attacking the bishop, but you're also spending very valuable time that you need to spend developing and getting your king to safety. This knight has already moved once. We don't need it to move twice, and we definitely do not need it to go away from the center. On c3, it's looking very nicely at the center, but on a4, it doesn't have other purpose than attacking the bishop, which can easily be defended or just move. Um, and then white anyway, at some point, has to drop the knight back to c3. So we do not want to go knight a4 at any point here. Um, and after a3, the game continued bishop f5. This is the most logical square for the bishop. But we will also see that the bishop can actually become a little bit awkward here very, very soon. Kasparov, he castled. Very normal. Um, black also developed. And here, now is the time that I think the game really starts. And now is the time that we can get to see what Kasparov he was so incredibly good at and why he was the world champion for so many years. In this position, Kasparov, he played g4. He is not hiding his intentions in any way. And now I want chat to take a few minutes here in this position to figure out what you want to do where should the bishop go should the bishop even go anywhere because this is actually when you're sitting at the board you have no clue you have no clue but right now i can tell you that this is a critical moment in the game after g4 so if chat just takes a few minutes here um but even with the bishop locked in, you don't want to go knight a4 for the reasons I, I mentioned. The knight shouldn't be on a4. It's not the square. The square for the knight is on c3. But Chad, if you can take a few minutes, if you can try to figure out where does the bishop go, 
and and why then I think it, it would be very nice and then I will take a sip of tea while you do it and maybe a little bit of water I don't know I think a lot of people today are following the Wesley So Hikaru Nakamura Speed Chess Championship semi-final which is of course very very exciting um, Please don't leave me since I said that if you didn't know. Stay here and let's learn some chess. This is an important moment in the game. Let's see. And yes, it is Nakamura's birthday. Indeed. Yes, the dedicated people are here to learn chess. I'm happy to hear. We have a few different, uh, we have a few different moves, which is good. Um, this position is not supposed to be easy in any way, and I think a lot of people in this position would actually make a mistake, M uh, myself included. Maybe I should say that I'm all. I would also be very likely to play the wrong move here. Because it's not easy to see why it's wrong. So we will just take a few more seconds. Give people a little time to think about it. And then we have... Okay, we have four different moves here. I'm very happy to see that. So let's go through the four different moves. We have, first of all, Queen A5. We have bishop e4, bishop g6, and knight takes g4. Those are the four moves that we have to examine. So firstly, queen a5. I don't think we want to play that because there's quite a few ways for white to win a piece here. Uh, the first one being b4, which very simply attacks the queen and the bishop with a fork. And then afterwards, we can decide which bishop we want to take on f5 or on c5. Secondly, knight takes g4 might be a bit too ambitious. Um, I can see the idea, but after a move like bishop f4, I don't think that black has the necessary attack that you would usually require when you sacrifice a piece like this. After a queen h4 and bishop g3, the white king side is actually very well protected by all of these pieces. Um, a5 I think just drops this bishop on f5 then there's the move bishop e4 and bishop e4 was the move played in the game and this is a mistake um, and we will get back to this bishop e4 looks very very logical um, but the right move in the position was bishop g6 just dropping the bishop back even though it can be scary to put the bishop here you could imagine that black was maybe refraining from this because white has very easy play. Let's say putting the bishop on f4, dropping it back to g3, king h1, and then f4 threatening to trap the bishop with f5. So the play for white is very easy after bishop g6. Maybe you could even go uh, king h1 immediately. There's a lot of options. Um, but this was the best move for sure, and this was the only way for black to not be worse in the game. I myself might have played bishop e4 also, not realizing why this is uh, why this is bad. But in this position, Kasparov, he did indeed find an incredibly, really strong move. Because my first thought in this position when I looked at it was, well... Maybe white wants to take this one, because after knight takes, then you're not trading the light squared bishop. Because I wasn't quite sure if I wanted to allow um, bishop takes g2 here, because after king takes g2, it seems like after pushing these pawns to h3 and g4, that the white king becomes very weak. But this is actually wrong, wrong... Uh, thoughts on my side um, 
2500 rated mistakes yeah i guess so um but bishop e4 is wrong and it's wrong for because of one move it's wrong because of one strong move and um there's a lot of very nice moves in this game so let's just take it the move here is knight g3 and the knight is very well placed on g3 and it's very well placed because it's one pointing towards the center and two pointing at this f5 square and you know the knight a knight on f5 is just one of the best attacking pieces ever um let's say if black now says okay i made a mistake i should have put my bishop on g6 then black really has lost a vital tempo and now the knight on f6 is trapped after g5 so um and we can just take a bit of more time to to look at this it cannot go to h5 because white has two pieces controlling this square um the pawn on d5 is well protected and it cannot go to any of of the other squares all squares are protected here um so after knight g3 black cannot even admit his mistake because sometimes when you play a game of chess and you make a mistake afterwards you have to admit it and you have to be like okay i made a mistake i will try to to make up for for this mistake but that's not possible here the damage has been done and now black has to follow his plan and take this um bishop on g2 and then king takes of course you want to take the bishop back and when we look at this position it's actually very difficult to see how it's possible for black to attack the white king and i find this quite quite amusing that there's really just no way for for black to attack this king because the king is on a light square and this is a dark squared bishop and how do you how do you bring your pieces to attack this king it's just not possible um so in this position uh black is already struggling and these kingside pawns they will very soon maybe even this also but then you have to be careful not to weaken the second rank they will just come marching down they will come marching down and they will try to crush you as well as they can um, and there is one very important threat in the position um, and that is and that is a very very important threat if this threat hadn't been uh, here then maybe black was able to play this queen e7 move as i see um, suggested in the chat but the problem with queen e7 was the same as we saw before here white can just play g5 and trap the knight so besides not being able to attack the king here on g2 then black also has to find a way to save this knight and i think this is a tactical nuance that makes this um that makes this exact position playable for white because if g5 wasn't a threat then maybe black would have time to create some counterplay but in this uh in this case black had to go passive um with or black played the passive move knight f8 to to uh to be able to get this knight to d7 i looked at this with the computer and it said that h6 was the best move but i can really understand why black did not want to uh, play this h6 i think over the board it's a very counterintuitive move because it's creating a hook we call this a hook we can see uh we can see these pawns on f7 g7 and h6 they have created like a little hook and a hook is an attacking point for the opponent and when you're playing over the board and you're creating a hook like this that your opponent in some cases can just chop off the board you get scared so i think it's what i think it's tough to criticize a move like knight f8 because h6 seems very counterintuitive to me at least um and now g5 pushing the knight on f7 uh, f6 back sorry and 
we see how the black pieces before black had a knight on f6 and a knight on d7 but both these knights have been pushed pushed back one rank and white has gained even more space the pieces are passive this rook is not developed this bishop isn't looking at any important points in white's position the bishop is better placed here but on e7 it actually would have been protecting the king more it would have been very very cramped down here if the bishop had been on e7 but at least it would have been able to protect the king because here it's not pointing at any important squares in white's position f2 is not weak because there's no other way for black to attack it um so and now we also we see the strong knight here on g3 and this knight on c3 is actually also very strong helping uh take control of this e4 square white played h4 just pushing the pawns more forward and this is I mean, this kind of move and this kind of play just makes me want to smile. Um, I think this is this is very Kasparov and this is this is very beautiful. The pawns are being pushed. Off we go. Let's mate the opponent. And after knight e5, yes, the knight is placed well on e5. It looks it looks great on e5. Like this is a nice knight. But h5, <laughs> h5, and the pawns are just the pawns are just being pushed more and more forward, and you know the king is. What is the king doing? The king is on g2, but you cannot attack it, um. And white is just much better. White is, if you look at this with the computer, the computer will say white is very close to winning here, um. But just looking at the position, it's. It makes you want to smile, doesn't it? These bonds, they look just so... They're pu getting pushed so much forward. And there's just not anything that Black can do about it. Um, Black kind of panicked and Black played f6. But you... Sometimes you know that if you... When you have to play a move like f6, things are starting to go a little bit uh, downhill or in the... Um, and if you're sitting at the black side and you just, you see Kasparov in front of you and you see Kasparov just pushing his pawns like this and you're just, I think I would, I would, uh, completely freak out already. Um, and now another very nice move because there's something we definitely do not want to do in this position. And what we definitely do not want to do is take this pawn. Because if we take this pawn, now we're actually allowing black to develop like black wants to. And now we actually start to see the problems of white's position. Because by pushing the pawns, we also do create some weaknesses here. We can see all these squares. Uh, they are struggling a little bit. Um, but Kasparov, he played a very nice move. He just brought this knight on c3 to e4 centralizing the knight getting it closer um bringing it into the attack getting it closer to the king and helping with the defense of this g5 pawn because after f takes g5 the bishop can take on g5 and now attack the queen and now the queen has to go to a square and this bishop has been brought into the attack also just with one move and since the queen now has to move after being attacked then white can spend or white can use another move after the queen uh, has gone somewhere by further developing the initiative and further improving his position um, and here here black play queen b6 and when we look at the queen on b6 we can already see that it's not doing much it's it's attacking b2 that's correct but white doesn't care about this b2 pawn. White wants the big prize. White wants the king in this position. And uh, yes, they are looking at the king. But you're not taking this pawn because the pawn is defended. And how else are you going to get close to the king? You're not going to get close to the king. And if you cannot attack the white king, then the white king is not weak. Um, so... 
sorry, I needed some <coughs> I needed some tea there. Um and we can also we can also try to look at other queen moves here. We can try to look at queen uh move like queen d7. Um and it, it looks like it's doing a better defensive job protecting this uh protecting the seventh rank. But for example, after h6, we this king is just falling apart. The white minor pieces are very nicely placed. And this queen, this queen that we have not talked about before, still has a way to get into the attack with just one move by going to h5. g6 is, of course, not very good as knight f6 is a check, picking up the queen on d7. And a move like queen f7. Um, getting the queen closer to the king to protect is just simply made by, met by h takes g7 and after for example uh, queen takes g7 knight f6 check king goes to h8 and queen h5 we see just by looking at the board that the, the black king is really getting attacked and now we also see another Good thing about this king being on a on g2, that it has made the h file available to the white pieces. This is just an example line to show that it can go wrong very very quickly, um, and why the white pieces are so well placed. Black did play queen b6 as set before. Um, yeah, sometimes I see that in the chat it's saying that the white attack does not seem obvious. Um, and sometimes it may not seem obvious before you start looking at a few lines. Because yes, the pawn advance can just go as far as it can. But when it goes far further, then it also starts to create weaknesses in the opponent's camp. Also now Kasparov, he played h6 here. And... These pawns, they had to react to this push. And no matter what they do, they will create a weakness in the position. And when the king gets more weakened, then we see the power of the minor pieces. For example, here, if black decided to take the pawn, then a very nice quiet move, bishop f6, takes away all the dark squares around the king. Um, and the only escape square the king can go to is f7. But it can't go anywhere from f7. <laughs> yes, it can go to g6, but you don't want to go to g6 going further up the board. You From f7, you cannot go to e7 or, or e6. So this king is... Sorry about my arrows here. This king is... This king is toast. Um, let's say the knight went to went to try to protect the poor king king h1 would have been truly beautiful would have been such a kasparov move in this position just getting the king to a bit of a more safe square before finishing his opponent off um, and it's a bit of a more safe square because this knight does have some squares on h4 and f4 but just getting the king to h1 improving the position getting ready to to bring our own pieces further and after for example rook f8 knight f5 we see here that oops <laughs> that the black position is just collapsing and there's no way for black to go attack this king on h1 um black did not take the pawn black did not like the prospects of taking the pawn so instead black played knight f7 said yes the knight on e5 looked very beautiful but i needed in the defense i needed to protect my king a little bit more and here kasparov he took the pawn on g7 and he's attacking this knight on d7 uh on d7 come on he's attacking this knight on f8 which um black has to which black has to react to. <laughs> so, so black has to react to this. And um, what 
what can black do here? Do we want to take this pawn? No, <laughs> no, we do not want to take this pawn because bishop f6 and the king back. And let's see here, I'm just improvising. Queen g4. The only move is knight g6. And maybe we can we can bring another piece. Maybe we can play rook h1 here. Maybe I can also play it before. Maybe I can play rook f1 here. And then I'm threatening a check here. And going to h5 and taking this pawn on h5. Uh, h7. Um, this king on g7. No thank you. Let's not have any of that. Maybe even bringing the queen to g4 first. Threatening with some kind of discovered check. Going somewhere with the bishop. So instead of in this position, black said, black actually did something which I think is very instructive. Um, it didn't work in this exact case, but it's always something that we have to keep in mind. Because as I said before, taking this pawn on g7 is a no-go. We don't want to have our king going up uh, to the center. So instead, black played knight d7 here. And this is a very, this is sometimes a very common theme where you say or where you try to use your opponent's pawn as a shield. Because you don't have your own pawn on g7 anymore. It's your opponent's pawn on g7. The pawn went all the way from h2 to h3, h4, h5, h6 and took on g7. It's only move 23. Um, and now black has to say, I will try to use your pawn as a shield for my king. Of course, this shield is not the safest shield in the entire world. It's kind of like a bomb in front of you. Because you cannot go to either side with the king. The king is trapped on g8. So, you have to do something else. Um, well, you have to protect your king in another fashion. And this pawn on h7 is very important because by not having your own pawn on g7, your, the adjacent pawn, the h7 be pawn, becomes even more weak and is um, a good attacking point for the white pieces. In this position, Kasparov played knight f6 check. And the reason he played this knight f6 check is that he's saying that, yes, this knight is very good on e4 in the center, but it has done its job and I want to keep my pawn on g7. I want to keep this pawn here, taking all the squares away from the black king. And if I'm being completely honest, now of course I have no clue. But my guess would be that Kasparov, he already saw the finish here in this position. Um, of course, the next move in the position is forced. You have to take the knight back. Because if you take this pawn, then you drop this knight on d7, you, you're down a piece, you're getting mated. So there's nothing to do here for black. You have to, after knight f6, you have to take the knight. There's no other way. And bishop takes. Now the bishop on f6 is protecting the pawn on g7. So the king is trapped in a cage. And let's also notice this knight on g3 here. Because this knight on g3 still has potential. It still has purpose in this position. It's not done. It's not over. This uh, the the knight's job is not over. Black qu played queen b five. Black is actually doing everything he can to try to hold his position together. He does have. I'm not ignoring you, no. Um, I am looking at the chat. I just didn't see uh, any. Um, I just didn't see any questions. I thought I just saw a few uh, a few comments, just a regular chat stuff, you know. So don't worry, I'm not ignoring you. I'm just trying to look out for questions. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to look out for questions to make uh, people understand it, uh, understand the position better. Um, King H one. Uh, in which position do you do you mean King H one?
probably this position. Um, probably this position. Okay, so in this position, we also have to notice this bishop is not only attacking the pawn, uh, defending the pawn on g7, it's also defending the pawn on b2. So the queen can never take this pawn anyway. Uh, very Im not too important because this pawn doesn't mean much. Um, but still a little bit important because maybe if the queen could take the pawn on b2, then it could easily get back into the defense of the king. But that's not possible. The bishop on f6 is protecting it. The defensive purposes of this move queen b5 is that you either want to go back to d7 or you want to come into c4. This is very sneaky um, by the opponent. But Kasparov, he had all of this under control. He played rook h1. Since the queen went to b5, it's no longer attacking the f2 pawn. And he could now bring the rook into the attack also. In this position, the move h6 might have put up a bit more of resistance in the game. But it really, um, it really would not have made any, uh, any change to the outcome of the game. For example, a move like rook h4 would also be very Kasparov. Improving the position of the rook, stopping this queen from intruding on c4, and after an example lying bishop b6, rook f4, rook a to c1, and queen h5, flag is not surviving this position. This knight is weak. If this knight goes, then this pawn goes, and we can already see the mating patterns with the queen landing on h8. Don't forget about that. So, in this position, Black played rook, uh, sorry, bishop b6. There wasn't much to do. The white queen entered the game, queen f3. And I'm already starting to smile because here black decided to play knight e5. And black is attacking the queen. Um, black is attacking the queen here. Oh, I see. I see. It's because oh, I just didn't read enough. Okay, uh, Sophie, thank you so much for the raid with a party of 35 on the Coach S Twitch channel. I really, uh, really appreciate it. That was why you said I was ignoring you. I'm sorry. I was just so into the game there. I was so into the game. 95 makes me smile. Of course, a shout out to Sophie. She's also very often doing these lectures. Um, or doing these lessons and now white played such a beautiful move here um, white played knight f5 the queen is under attack but we don't need that queen to mate in this position because if you take the queen then there's a mate on h6 um, and this would be a very nice mate to finish the game we can see that the knight is taking the f7 square square which was the only square for the king to run to and this is just a beautiful mate so why uh, black decided to drop back with the knight to f7 to protect this h6 square so that the knight couldn't go to h6 and checkmate the black king and now this is actually the reason why i remembered the game because when when I was told that this lesson was about learning from Kasparov, I immediately thought of one game. And I could just remember the finishing move. And I, could remem I couldn't remember how the pieces were. But I could remember something about the white pieces being very much forward, um, close to the black king. And, but I just remembered the last move. And I was lying in my bed and I was like, ooh, what is it? But I couldn't remember, so I went to bed, and then today, when I was thinking, then for some weird reason, I remembered, oh, this game is in dynamic decision making. And I was like, yes, I found the game, um, just because of this move. This is all, this was, all, I tried to search on the internet and I couldn't find it, but this move is truly beautiful. Um, and I see that the move has been suggested some places and we're also running out of time. So let's just take it. The move is rook. That was a bit anticlimactic. <laughs> the move is rook takes, eight, rook takes h7. And this was such a nice finish to the game. Gary Kasparov versus 
I cannot remember his first name, something with I, some from Baku in 1980. Um, and we can see why this move is winning on the spot and why Black resigned here. The three and after knight takes h8, we promote to a queen. And because the bishop on f6 is protecting the promotion square, then um, then white would just be a queen up and win the game. After king takes h7, now we see this move, this rook from a1 not having done uh, much during the game there on a1, but it's being brought all the way to h1, giving a check. And after king g8, rook h8, knight takes queen uh, g takes equals queen king f7 and we do have a mate in the next move um so this rook takes h7 move i thought was really nice um the game between kasparov and some this was uh, the lesson uh from coaches and julio spare learn from kasparov i heard that i hope that you liked this lesson and that you liked the game I picked out for you. Of course, there are an infinite amount of Kasparov games, amazing Kasparov games to choose from. But this uh, this was the one I really wanted to, to teach today. So thank you everyone so much for watching. I hope that you've had a great day and that you enjoyed the lesson. And I will hopefully, uh, I will hopefully see you next time. Um, and don't forget to follow Coaches on Twitch. Go and check out coaches.com or, uh, or of course, where many of you uh, are from on the Chess24 YouTube channel. And then you must all have a very good night.